Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, moni moni wanji, namaste, jambo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted that you are joining us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Please do be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Audible, Stitcher Radio, Podchaser, Podcast Addict. You kind of get it. Wherever you find your podcast, you can find the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest today is Ruth Behar. She is here to celebrate Tia Fortuna's new home. Before we welcome Ruth into the studio, we want to let you know that this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by The Power of Choice by Claude Larson. Struggling to communicate with your teenager? You're not alone. The world is competing for their attention. If you are looking for a straightforward and practical resource to open the door to crucial conversations, The Power of of Choice, A Teen's Guide to Finding Personal Success, was written just for you. Help your teen sort through the madness and find their way on the rocky path of adolescence. Create a better relationship as you help them make decisions for their future. Are you ready to empower your teenager? Then make sure that you visit Amazon or wherever you find your books and get your copy of The Power of Choice, A Teen's Guide to Finding Personal Success by Claude Larson. Join us right now from the beautiful state of Michigan. Our guest is here today to celebrate a really wonderful picture book. It's called Tia Fortuna's New Home. Please welcome to the show, Ruth Behar. Hey, Ruth, bienvenidos. Gracias. So nice to be with you. Thank you for having me, Jed. (laughs) I'm excited to have you on. Tell us all about Tia Fortuna and her new home, please. (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely. Well, it's a picture book. It's my debut picture book. And it's about uh, an auntie, Tia Fortuna, who lives in Miami Beach. She's been living in a very sweet cottage right by the ocean. And uh, she has an interesting history. Her family's originally way, way back from Spain, but more recently from Turkey and Cuba. But now she's been living in Miami for many years, and she has a little niece named Estrella, who really adores her and loves to spend time uh, with her at her uh, beach house. Uh, But it turns out that Tia Fortuna has to leave her home. It's going to be demolished. The building is going to be demolished. There's going to be a luxury hotel built there, and Tia Fortuna must leave. And so Estrella comes to spend that last day with her at her um, cottage um, at a building called the Seaway. And they spend the day together um, enjoying the the house, the casita that, uh, that Tia Fortuna has had all these years. And then Estrella helps her pack up and um, <laughs> and go to her new home, which we can talk more about um, in a moment, what the new home is. Okay. That sounds good. You know, right off the bat, you know, a lot of us think of picture books as just being for little kids. And certainly little kids love picture books. It's a great way to engage them, to talk about the illustrations, to give them the sense that they are able to read. But the first thing that came to my mind is I know lots of young adults who would just go crazy and start having some very intense conversations about gentric- gentrification, um, just reading that, that, you know, just hearing the first part of the book. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I had gentrification on my mind. And I think of picture books as books that are for small children, you know, five, six-year-old kids. Um, they can love the pictures. They can love the story. But I think of picture books as being kind of for everybody, mm-hmm. too, because, You know, we read a picture book. The adult reads a picture book to the child. So it also has to appeal to the adult Mm -hmm. on some level as well. And we all carry a child um, inside of us as well. So in some ways, when we're reading to an actual child, we're also reading to the child inside of us. And when I wrote the book, sometimes I felt I was Tia Fortuna 
And sometimes I felt I was Estrella. I kind of like, wait, who am I? Am I the child here or am I, you know, am I the elder? I kind of felt I was both because I am an elder now, but I do remember being a child very distinctly too. So I felt like I kind of could go back and forth. And I think, yes, I think the book can open up a conversation about gentrification. Um, in fact, people in Miami are very excited about this book because it kind of tells a story about Miami and how Miami Beach in particular um, is changing. So I think it's going to resonate on, on that level as well for many readers, but it's very much a book that a child can also enjoy and can get the message in a child-friendly way. That's, that's what I was striving for mm -hmm. in the book, that it's child-friendly, but others, adults, can read it and also find a different kind of meaning from the story. Yeah. That whole issue of gentr gentrification, it's not just affecting folks in places like Miami Beach, but in, in cities and towns all over the country. I know here in Boston, there's... Um, uh, a, a lot of gentrification going on. Folks who have been in a community for decades, um, you know, being forced out. They, they're not able to afford the homes, that, the places that they've called home for, for so many years. And it's uh, so heartbreaking on on so many levels. Um, and it's not, you know, and, and, and I can understand the sort of economics of it. You know, I know how the economy works, you know, but I don't know. I think, um, I think this is a good time in our history to sit down and, uh, decide if we want to somehow, uh, give our economy a, a heart transplant, give it, you know, give the economy a, a healthier, more compassionate heart than it has at the moment. I totally agree with you. I'm I'm all into heart and a passionate heart, a absolutely. And I think housing is one of our biggest problems in this country right now. Housing and what is home um, as well, those two issues are huge. Um, they've always been very, very important to me and to my thinking. And, and I did want to, in some way, open a conversation about that. Um, you know, what, you know, what are we going to do about affordable housing, you know, with the rise of gentrification, the inflation, I mean, all the problems that we've been facing, and especially in these last two years of the pandemic, I mean, housing is a really serious issue. And it's kind of one of our most fundamental needs as human beings, you know, we need we need a safe and secure place to live, we know how much kids need that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so yeah, so in a way that's that's there um, in the story and um, and Estrella, the little girl, you know, she's really feeling it. You know, she's really feeling, you know, what it means that her auntie, her tia Fortuna, who she adores, has to leave this beautiful house by the beach, you know, um, and she's had to leave other homes before the book begins with her having to leave her home in Havana, her home in Cuba, start again. Um, in Miami, and there's like a longer legacy of displacement because the family, you know, harkens back to, to Turkey and before that, centuries before, to Spain. She's she's a Sephardic Jew, and so she's part of a community that was expelled from Spain in the 15th century, but always remembered their Spanish past and the Spanish language. So she carries all of this history and all of this understanding of having to leave home and having to start again. Um, and so that's very much um, a part of the story. And it's in part what she's transmitting to her niece, Estrella. She's transmitting this, this loss, this you know, long-term loss that she and many others like her have experienced in different kinds of ways, um, but also how to move forward and how to accept the new home that you can eventually, hopefully, find as well. Yeah. I think a lot of... A lot of us, when we think of, well, too many of us here in the States, when we think of Latin culture, we, we think of this one big tent and that everybody who considers themselves Latin is under. And, you know, a lot of folks are like, oh, Cubans and Dominicans and Puerto Ricans and Panamanians and, uh, and Brazilians. Yeah, they, I think they speak a different language, but they all belong underneath that tent. They're all the same. And the reality is that's... Not true in the least. The differences in the cultures are vast and wonderful. They do share a lot, a lot of uh, a, a lot of things, but they're they're also very very different and unique and beautiful. 
One thing I don't think a lot of people associate with Latin culture is um, the Jewish religion. I don't think a lot of people understand that there there is a a part of of Latin the Latin community that are are Jewish. Yeah, no, absolutely, and that's a topic that really fascinates me because I'm Jewish Cuban myself, and I've always been, of course, very interested in understanding this history. How did how did it come to be? Uh, there are Jewish people living all over Latin America, um, and then we've got the whole history of Sephardic Jews, and these are Jews who, again, were expelled from Spain in 1492 because they were given the choice of either converting or leaving, <laughs> or having to leave, and so the Sephardic Jews are the ones that chose to leave, and but they held on to the Spanish language, so in a way, I think of Sephardic Jews as sort of the original Latinos, you know, they, they were expelled from Spain, but, you know, but they held on to Spanish and they held on to this memory, this nostalgia for a place where they had lived for hundreds and hundreds of years, for as, as long as a thousand years, there had been a Jewish community in Spain, but then they were expelled. Um, but they had that nostalgia for this place that expelled them and they held on to their language, which is called Judeo. Espanol or Ladino. So in a way, they were the original, I think of them as the original Jewish Latinos, you know. Um, but in addition to that, we have lots of Jewish people who immigrated to different parts of Latin America at the beginning of the 20th century, um, most of them between World War I and World War II when conditions were getting really bad for Jewish people in Europe, particularly in Eastern Europe, but even in uh, Southern Europe. And so um, the countries of Latin America were opening their doors to these Jewish immigrants, while the United States had actually closed its doors to most of these immigrants. They had um, it created a quota system that limited the number of Jewish people that could come into the United States, essentially. And so people found their way to other countries, to the other America, um, the America south of the U.S. border. And Cuba, in particular, was a hub um, for many Jewish um, immigrants because it was very close to the United States. And so, you know, back in the time before the Internet, um, all that people knew was, well, Cuba's very close to the United States. You can practically swim <laughs> over if you get to Cuba. So people went um, to Cuba expecting to come to the United States, and many did. Many did kind of use it as a trampoline to then come over um, to the United States. But others, like my family and many thousands of people, just fell in love with Cuba. And, um, and they stayed in Cuba and became part of the Cuban nation. Um, but many then left after Fidel Castro came to power. Many then left in the 60s and restarted their lives in the United States. Um, so that's Cuba, but there are Jewish people in Puerto Rico, there are Jewish people in Brazil, in Argentina, Mexico. You find these Jewish communities um, there that I've always found very, very fascinating how, um, how these communities, you know, manage both their identity as Latinos or as Latin Americans and how they manage their identity as Jewish people. Mm -hmm. um, it's really, really fascinating to me. And, and I grew up with that combination, you know, we we would, for example, celebrate Passover with matzah, you know, for a whole week. And then as soon as Passover was over, we'd go celebrate at a Cuban restaurant in mm -hmm. New York, you know, <laughs> we'd go to Rincon Criollo, you know, to have a good Cuban meal. So there's always this sense of, you know, this combination of the cultures. Yeah. yeah. And I think that is so beautiful. And I think it's fascinating. And I think it would be a really wonderful thing for a family sitting down and reading Tia Fortuna's new home to kind of just start that conversation, not only about Tia Fortuna and about this book and about gentrification, but about immigration and helping, helping our kids and helping ourselves understand that we, the human race has been immigrating and spreading throughout history, throughout our existence We've been moving and, and for, for different reasons. Sometimes we're expelled and sometimes we choose to move to different places. Um, and I think, I think at, at the very least, if, if we can do that, then we can have uh, more of an understanding and compassion for folks who are trying to immigrate to different parts of the world um, for various reasons. But I also think it can help us just see that 
we have so much more in common with each other than we think we do. Yeah, no, I'm totally with you on that. Um, you know, I think one of the ways to read Tia Fortuna is that it is about honoring the immigrant and how immigrants are able to to restart and, you know, and just give so much to the new societies that they become a part of, the, new, the culture that they bring with them as they move from place to place. I think that's a very, very important um, thing to, to, to keep in mind. Um, and also the interconnectedness of all of us as human beings, you know, somebody reading this book may not have the same background, obviously, as, as Tia Fortuna and Estrella. There aren't that many, you know, Cuban Jews <laughs> out there. Um, so I wasn't expecting, you know, for the reader to necessarily have this background, but definitely to feel connected to what, you know, what they're going through. It's both a very particular story, and I feel it's a very universal story um, as well. Um, and it's that interconnectedness that I think is so important, that, that human story um, that I hope people can relate to, what it means to have to give up a home and find another home. Um, and in the case of Tia Fortuna, I guess I'll go ahead and say mm -hmm. that she's going to what we call a home um, or what we now, I think now, you know, use the term assisted living rather than calling it a home. Mm -hmm. um, but it's funny, you know, that like when I've talked to my mother, who is now 85, and she'll she'll be talking to me in Spanish, she'll say, no me pongan en un home. So she'll use un home <laughs> in English, but like, don't put me in a home, you know. Um, and I think for so many people, it's kind of a scary destination to be in an assisted living place. And I wanted to kind of think about it in a different way. Um, in this book, you know, of course, it's scary to leave your own particular home and be with, you know, with a group of people in an assisted living or in a shared home. Um, but I wanted to to give it a little bit more of a positive mm -hmm. light, because I thought, you know, it can be scary, perhaps to a child to see an elder, you know, going to an assisted living into a shared home. And I thought, well, you know, maybe there's a positive way to, to think about this, that it could be a place to, to share stories. Uh, Tia Fortuna gets there and there's another woman um, also from Cuba with a very different background, but who also, you know, used to wave to the ships, you know, at the port of Havana. So, so she finds somebody with a shared history, but then she finds all these other people with very different histories and, and the possibility of her making new friends there and kind of, you know, looking at this new life, this new home um, with hope. That mm -hmm. was that was one of the things that I wanted to um, to relay and um, and for, you know, Estrella, the, the child, um, to to recognize this and, and to realize things are going to be OK mm -hmm. for her auntie. It's been hard to leave her home, but um, but it's going to be all right. Yeah. And that is that's a situation that so many more families are facing now as our ability to keep our elders, and I'm in that group, healthy. Um, you know, there are more and more folks who need to make the choice to do assisted living or, you know, um, uh, even uh, a nursing home. And it's a difficult, it's a really difficult conversation to have with our kids. And But it's a conversation we need to have with our kids. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, in the first version of the book, when I started writing it several years ago, it was a different story. It was about Tia Fortuna going and volunteering in a home rather than actually being the one who would eventually go to the home. And then mm -hmm. as the story evolved in, in my mind, I, I then thought, no, no, she's going to be the one that actually is going uh, to the home. And I thought that was important precisely for what you just said, that, you know, that to open up that conversation and to consider a home is not necessarily a bad or a scary place, but possibly a place where good care mm -hmm. can be given um, to elders. And the book in part was also inspired by a home that I did visit, um, a nursing home that I visited in Miami, uh, many, many years ago, where I met several elders who were very happy there and their caretakers were, were very kind and spoke multiple languages. And, and I thought, oh, well, this, this is nice. They're, they're happy there. And it was a beautiful place with, you know, gardens and palm trees and butterflies. And so that was partly the inspiration for this as well, that, 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 you know, that a nursing home could, could be, um, a nice place to be yeah. in at, at the end of your life. Absolutely. 
You know, we, we talked about the fact that uh, Tia Fortuna gives families an opportunity to start talking about the beautiful diversity that's found throughout Latin culture. I think one area that we don't talk about that often is the fact that the Jewish culture is also very diverse. Um, you have Has- Has- Hasidic Jews and you have Sephardic Jews. And uh, do, do you talk a little bit more in, in the story about that that? branch of Judaism, the, the Sephardic Jews? It, yes, it comes up. Thank you for asking that. Yeah, and I think that's such a good point. We just talked about the diversity of Latin American culture, and now we talk about the diversity of Jewish culture, and I'm interested in that double diversity. I think that they're both, you know, communities that we often stereotype mm-hmm. in certain kinds of ways and assume that, you know, all of Latin American culture is Catholic, you know, or, or all of Jewish culture is Ashkenazi is, you know, Yiddish speaking background or Hasidic, etc. I mean, we have these assumptions of, of what a Jew should look and sound like, what background they might have. Um, and so, yeah, so I think the book does does definitely reveal that diversity. It does show um, something of Sephardic heritage and culture. Um, we see that, for example, Tia Fortuna is wearing her, just like me, wearing her lucky eye uh, bracelets. There's a lot of belief in the Sephardic community in, in luck um, and fear of the evil eye. And so you wear these lucky eyes um, to, you know, to protect yourself against, against, you know, bad, bad spirits, evil eyes. That's very much of a Sephardic belief. We also see food traditions come up um, in the story, the borrecas, uh, which are uh, a delicious, you know, little pastry turnover um, that's very, very common in the Sephardic community. And I grew up eating those because my my father's family um, is Sephardic, and that's that's where I get my Sephardic heritage from. And my grandmother, my abuela, used to make these wonderful um, borrecas filled with potato and cheese. Mm. Um, and so the borrecas come up um, in the story as well. And then there is the tradition of the key. So the key is very much an important symbol to the Sephardic community. And there's a legend that the Sephardic Jews, when they left Spain in the 15th century, that many of them took the keys to their houses and they expected to return one day, but didn't. Right. But they held on to the keys. You know, we don't know. Some, sometimes you hear stories of people who have found an old key <laughs> in the family. So I don't know whether that's true or not, but it's such a beautiful legend. Um, so the key also comes up again, not not in any way sort of dictating these ideas to a child. But um, but because Estrella loves the seaway so much, the house where Tia Fortuna has lived for so many, so many years, um, at the end of the story, she receives the key from her aunt as as a memory, as a souvenir of, of this home that she also loved, just the way Tia Fortuna for years carries the key around her neck of the home she had in Havana. Uh-huh. So that, that symbolism of the key is, is there. Again, very kind of lightly. It's not, you know, it's not anything that's, that's imposed on the reader, but, but it's there. The symbolism um, is there, and that will connect very much with the Sephardic story. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Before we go, I just want to touch, because I noticed that the illustrations in the book are beautiful, and I noticed that your illustrator uh, grew up in a part of the world that I absolutely adore, the beautiful country of Panama. Talk a little bit about your illustrator, please. Yeah, so Devin Holtzworth is an amazing artist and illustrator, and having grown up in Panama, she has a real sentimiento, a real heart for Latin American culture and for Cuban culture. And she was just so fabulous to work with. Um, I sent over a lot of material that she incorporated, including pictures of some embroidered pillows that I <laughs> that I have that I love. I love embroidered pillows in Spanish. So I have one that says Amor Eterno. I mean, I have all these pillows. So I sent pictures of pillows. I sent pictures of the Lucky Eye bracelets. I sent pictures of my family just to give her an idea of like what a Sephardic person might look like. <laughs> so I, I sent all of this material and even pictures of the Seaway building, which is an actual building um, in, in Miami Beach that is in fact being demolished now. And um, so I sent all of this material, like all of this, like archival, you know, material. And um, and she was so wonderful. She incorporated it. She reimagined it in her art. The art is just very exuberant, 
beautiful, um, colorful, um, evocative of this culture. Um, she also asked for just some like historical information about Sephardic Jews. And I sent over pictures of synagogues that have been reclaimed in Spain, everything I could think of, pictures of pomegranates, I mean, everything I could think of that might connect with the culture. And she was so amazing. She reimagined it and, um, and really, really uh, made the story exuberantly come alive. Um, and, and particularly the way she imagined Tia Fortuna and her niece Estrella, I think the two characters are so beautifully uh, rendered um, in the art. So I love the book um, and I love it because of the illustrations. I think it really just is stunning, stunning work. And I'm just so, so glad that my publisher uh, made that happen. Yeah, well, we really want to encourage everybody to go check out Tia Fortuna's new home. Where's the best place for, for folks to go to find out more about your book and find out more about you? Well, they can always go to my website, which is just ruthbehar.com. They can go to any bookstore to, to find the book. Um, the book will also be available in Spanish, which I'm very excited about. It'll come out simultaneously in Spanish as El Nuevo Hogar de Tia Fortuna. Um, there's also the audio, and I read it both in English and Spanish, so the audio will be available. So it'll all be available um, at your favorite bookstore, online, um, through the publisher, um, Penguin Random House. Um, so many, many ways um, to find the book, and hopefully it will be in libraries as well so people can easily access it. Yeah. Well, we've had a wonderful time. We spoke about a lot of things about Latin culture, Jewish culture, gentrification, uh, elderly care. Um, people are going to – really, you talked about all of that in a, about a kid's book? But, yeah. About a kid's book. We've had a great time speaking with the author of Tia Fortuna's new home, Ruth Behar. Hey, Ruth, thank you so very much. Thank you. It was great to talk to you. Thank you so much. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Mark Brown, the author, the creator of Arthur. There's a brand new Arthur book out. It's called Believe in Yourself, What We Learned from Arthur. This is a, a fantastic interview. I'm so honored uh, that Mark, who created Arthur 45 years ago and then created the PBS uh, series 25 years ago, he's on the Reading With Your Kids podcast. It's our next episode, and it is an absolutely wonderful, wonderful interview. You don't want to miss it. That's the next episode of the show. Hey, we would love for you to connect with us on social media. There's a bunch of different ways you can connect with us on Facebook. Facebook.com slash reading with your kids. You can connect with us on Instagram at reading with your kids. You can find us on Twitter at not reading with your kids at Jedly Magic. And you can also find our page on Pinterest reading with your kids and of course you can visit our website readingwithyourkids.com uh, you can go there find out about about our certified great read program visit our certified great read wall of fame uh, you can also learn how you can bring one of our live events to your community and you can use the contact button at the top of the page to send us a message let us know who you think we should have on the podcast let us know who your favorite guest was let us know if we made a mistake we'd love to hear from you I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, we want to start by thanking our guest, Ruth Behar. Please be sure to check out Tia Fortuna's new home. I also want to thank our sponsor, The Power of Choice, a teen's guide to personal success by Claude Larson. I want to thank my team, Alejandro Doherty, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Skylar Strauss. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Oh, yeah.